Um, hi, everyone. Uh, or I should rather say in the Somali spirit, Ahoy, mi terex, ar! I'm a toolmaker, and I have a team of very talented toolmakers with me. As a toolmaker, a, a tool is never finished until the deadline. So this talk has been constantly evolving through this day, through all the talks, and uh, I hope I can share a, a message to you all. But before I tell you about tool making, um, 30 years ago, I was a 10-month-old little infant, and I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, this cancer was diagnosed um, in my eye, in my retina, a cancer called retinoblastoma. And I mean, obviously, this can be a fatal disease. If left untreated, I would have been dead. I wouldn't have been able to stand here in front of you. But thank goodness to my mom and my dad and to a host of specialists just a stone throw from here at Grote Hospital, they managed to successfully remove my eye and also subsequently remove the cancer. So this is why I can stand here in front of you. And this, the reason I'm here is purely because of science and technology, medical science. And as a, as a scientist, as a biochemist, an entrepreneur, an inventor, and a, a tool visionary, this, this message really excites me, and I would love to, to share this with you. But before I do that, I, would, I have to mention this guy, one of the, the biggest product visionaries of our time. Unfortunately, his life came to an end, but he, in one of his first public speeches in 1983, coincidentally also 30 years ago, roughly the same time I was removed, he quoted a, an article from the Scientific American. And this article compared a host of different animals with regards to the efficiency of locomotion. How well can they move with minimal amount of energy? And we, we were really bad. We didn't perform that well at all. But some bright spark at Scientific American decided, well, let's put this man on a bicycle. And they did it, and they rerun the test. So I didn't know what they did back then. But the human on the bicycle came out tops. And the reason Steve Jobs quoted this, uh, this Scientific American article was to convey the fact that man, as a toolmaker, has the inherent ability to supersede our abilities, we can become better with technology. And this is a message very close to my heart, and I would like to share this message to you with, with, on, with a tool that I specifically, specifically work with quite often, this tool being digital health. But before I get to that, I would first love to address the general principle of tool making. So there's four things you need to build a tool. It's very simple. You just never make the deadlines. Um, <laughs> You have, you have a need for a tool. A need needs to exist. And you need to find resources, and there needs to be some tinkerer, some maker, to use these resources according to a very specific plan to address this need. That's basically the tool-making process. And I'm here today to tell you about digital health and how this process can be applied on digital health tools. So, I don't know how many of you, I don't know if the wave has already reached South Africa, how many of you have any digital health tools? For those of you who know what it is, just by a raise of hands. Okay, so very few, so I'm at the right time at the right place because you can make the, the, the good future decisions. But these devices, you see them all over the states. You, it's like bracelets you put around your arm, like pedometer things, they measure movement, they measure physical activity, and people are really like honing in on this tool-making process and because it can inherently enhance our ability as humans um, to supersede our biological constraints and, and, and our limitations. And um, I would first like to tell you about the tool-making process in general, and then I want to discuss my team. But first, you can start from two sides, and I'm going to give an example based on a regular wristwatch. A wristwatch... Um, if you go back in time, early humans, it was inevitable that they saw the movement of the sun, 
They saw shadows being cast from objects and, and how they got longer as the day progressed. It was an inevitability that tools would arise from this process, like sophisticated sundials. But modern watches that we have around our, our arms or on our smartphones would never have existed if people didn't free themselves from those material constraints, being the sun and objects casting shadows in this case, we really had to readdress the problem from the need side, to readdress the problem to know how can we make accurate timepiece, timekeeping devices without using the sun? How can we tell the time inside of this building? And there, a lot of product visionaries and inventors tackle this problem from the need side and work from the need side back to the material side. And this is why you can see things like pendulum clocks, modern wristwatches, all these different things. It's because it's been addressed on the need side. And I want to go back to these three devices I talked about earlier. Both of these three devices, or all three of these devices, both of these three devices, <laughs> um, contains a very small integrated component called an accelerometer. Now, accelerometer is, measures the rate of change of velocity over time, so you can get an estimate of someone's movement. And this is, for me, a, a, an example of a resource-driven process where a component became available, people said, what can we build with this? And there, therefore, we see eight, nine, ten of these devices on the market currently, all accelerometer-based. And they're simply distingui distinguished by design. And I'm not saying design is not important. Design is critically important. But design should follow function to a T. It should be... It, it should be functional. That's what design is all about. And it should start from the need side. And I'm specifically talking to the tool makers here. Guys, if you build tools, take a step back, just like the process of watchmaking, and readdress the problem from the need side. Because then you will build magical tools, tools that are completely unexpected by people. And there are several needs. And these are the needs of everyone in this crowd. Probably I don't know. But many people would probably want to know this, like, are my current living conditions going to enhance my quality of life? Are my current living conditions going to make me live longer? Um, what can I do to sleep better? Do I need to see a doctor now? Well, not right now, I'm in a speech, but do I need to see a doctor now? Um, do I currently have cancer? This is, is a very important question, and these are questions that we need to address. Am I exercising too hard, for instance? I over the last couple of months, lost more than 40 kilograms, simply from knowing one thing, from understanding my body and from understanding nutrition better. And that's all, it's addressing the need and really addressing the education of people, how well they understand things. And this also comes down to, I don't think, um, and I don't want to bash any talks, I don't think it's, it's, it's a free market principle that government should interfere. I could change my nutrition because I educated myself, and I think education is key, and that's where these devices are really essential. And this brings me back to, to my team, because without my team, this wouldn't have been possible. I needed these fellow toolmakers. You see, if you stand back and you start looking at things from the need side, then all of a sudden you're not asking questions like, who can I get in my team that can build a component or that can, can work on this component to build something? You starting from the need side, and then it's a whole new can of worms. Because you don't know where you're heading. It's uncharted territory. So you find generalists. You find people that are specialists in, in a single thing, but they are generalists. They can, they can move about. They can, they can constantly look at the need and address that need together. And I need to show you a picture. This was early days when we started back in my attic, um, where we just started tinkering. We just started to try and address this need. And since then, things have, have, have changed. We've acquired some funding. We could get an old rustic house in Stellenbosch, where we could just do our thing. Um, here's just some pics that I want to show you guys. Busy doing electronics. This is a room where there's two biologists and a mathematical statistician in the room. It's about integration. It's about 
But such a stage photo, that's about electronics. <laughs> that's not about bong smoking, it's about calibrating devices. <laughs> it's about building beautiful stuff where some of my team members don't even know whether they are currently busy with science or art. That is what device making is all about. And if you address a question from the need side, if you address a question from the need side, you don't know what route you're going to follow. It's going to be almost an impossible route to know, and that's why you also need probably going to build impossible tools. For instance, we constructed the world's first metabolic chamber. Now, it is, <laughs> there's about 20 of chambers in the world. A metabolic chamber, what is a metabolic chamber? You go into the chamber, you, it's a free living environment that simply measures your oxygen uptake and your carbon dioxide production. And that gives very clear indications of metabolism, what fuel you're using, and, the, and there's a, a vast array of information you can get out of this. These things cost a million dollars to construct, two million dollars to construct, but with a team that are need-centric and very generalist, we could construct this with about 200 to 300,000 rand. Using off-the-shelf components, using just thinking out of the box. Um, that is not a rehearsal for the Titanic on the left. <laughs> that, is, that is a co-founder, that is a co-founder's sweat. And that is, you follow a need-driven process. That sweat is inevitable, that passion and that drive. That's Franco de Priem, one of my co-founders, busy with his day job. Um, <laughs> this is our team, and I love this pick because everyone's doing something different, all generalists, and they manage to construct this tool, this really unexpected tool. And we got quite a lot of publicity from this, and it gave us traction. We could even further get like-minded people to latch into our dream and to really make this a reality. So, unfortunately, I cannot divulge anything about our products at this stage. Uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> but all I can say is watch this space. And I want to, as a last, because I'm already over time, um, I just want to latch on to what Nick said earlier about, what was it, Nick? <laughs> about incompetence. So incompetence, if you start from a need-driven approach, there's no way that you're not going to feel incompetent. So you, as a team, you also grow, and you, you just go, get strong. And guys, this is a terrible path to follow. It's really terrifying, in a way, to, make, to follow the need-driven process, because there's all these avenues. But I want to leave you with one, one quote. And this is a quote from Paul Graham from Y Combinator, where he says, the biggest startup ideas are terrifying. Thank you.